Okay, so um, today I just wanted to, or I would like to present um, um, a method that I started working on uh, uh, in, for my dissertation, and um, I have continued to work on since then, on, a, on and off, uh, um, a lot with uh, my colleague Kevin Ryan, um, who is uh, uh, at Harvard in linguistics, and more recently with a colleague, um, Taylor Arnold, who is at my um, current institution, University of Richmond, uh, in, the, in the math department. Um, and um, the, the, uh, the method has just been developed um, uh, specifically uh, to sort of guide reconstruction of the big data. Uh, but I would like to think that it has uh, some broader applications. And so I, I will be, as always, interested in your uh, critique of this particular uh, method, but I'm at least as interested uh, in your ideas of where we might potentially apply it, um, say, uh, elsewhere. Should I stand more this way? Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, just a, a brief um, sort of intro to the Rig Veda. Um, this is the oldest text of the Indic branch of Indo-European, uh, also called uh, Indo-Aryan. Um, uh, the language is likewise called Vedic. Um, and unlike classical Sanskrit, uh, it's a living language. And we know that because we watch uh, changes, uh, or observe changes in every part of the grammar um, between the oldest Vedic text, which is the Rig Veda, and the sort of through Middle Vedic and, and Younger Vedic um, uh, until it's sort of fixed as classical Sanskrit. Um, and uh, what, what the, the Rig Veda contains uh, are um, a bunch of praise poems, uh, mostly praising uh, uh, the, the deities of the Vedic pantheon and sort of uh, trying to motivate them to attend the ritual where the, the poem is being performed. Um, and, uh, and sort of uh, benefit the, the ritualists. Um, um, the, the entire uh, text is in, in poetic meter, um, and there are, uh, and all of the meters uh, have in common that they uh, regulate uh, syllable count um, and also syllable weight distribution, and uh, some of them also have Cesare, that is to say, points in the verse line where a word or phrase break is required. Um, uh, and, and it's important to know about Vedic that, that um, there's a two-way uh, syllable weight distinction between light on the one hand and heavy on the other. And if a syllable um, uh, ends in a short vowel only, uh, it counts as light and all other syllables are heavy, that is to say, Long vowel syllables, you know, short vowel plus consonant rhymes, uh, long vowel plus consonant rhymes, and so forth. Okay. So here's um, here's a sort of rough representation of the eight syllable verse type, and so I'm using the the, the sort of X or a sign for. Um, or I should start with the brev. I'm using that for to to show positions that are usually implemented with a light syllable, so about a third of the time, only, only heavy about a third of the time, then the X, you know, is just shows rel you know, relatively free positions that are sort of um, only, that are heavy anywhere from one-third to two-thirds of the time, and the, uh, the macron, uh, or the long mark, uh, shows you um, preferentially heavy positions. And you can see that there's essentially like an, an iambic rhythm to the verse. It goes, you know, da dun da dun da dun da dun um, And there are sort of two additional and well-known principles at work here. Uh, one is so-called, um, I think this is on the next slide. Yes. One is, one is final strictness, and this applies to the verse line, and it essentially says that the later in the line, the more strictly syllable weight is regulated. Um, I guess there are good typological parallels for this as well. And then the other one uh, is, is final indifference, and this just applies to the last position or the last syllable um, of the verse, and that, that's relatively indifferent to weight. So even though you know, 
analyzing this as an underlyingly iambic meter, you would expect you know, to find he uh, heavy syllables uh, uh, in the last position. Um, final indifference sort of uh, permits you to uh, implement that with either a light or a heavy syllable. Um, and the 11 syllable verse line um, either has a caesura after the fourth uh, uh, position or after the fifth. And you can see it's sort of, there's an iambic opening like den, den, da, den, and then da, da, den, den, da, den, den. And, uh, or you could go da, den, da, den, den, da, da, den, da, den, den. And so I, I have to stress the preferentially heavy positions to sort of be able to hear them because, <laughs> because I'm an English speaker like this. Um, and the 12 is really uh, uh, just like the 11, except that you uh, sort of descriptively insert a preferentially light position in the penultimate position of the verse. So it opens the same way, da dun da dun, and then you have the same sort of da da dun, and then instead of having den da dun den, you have den da den da den. Okay, and so I, I'm, I'm almost over with the description of the, <laughs> of the meter, so <laughs> bear with me. So. Um, okay, and so you, you basically you just um, you just put these verse lines together in threes or fours usually um, sometimes other combinations to make uh, up a stanza and you can show that there's more structure than just the line it's not a purely stickic verse type there's evidence for couplet like structure and for stanza structure and so forth too but for us it's really just the verse line that's important. So most of the Rig Veda, 83%, is composed in verse lines of the three types that I just described. Um, and so for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to be excluding the rest of them, the sort of unusual, uh, unusual meters, right, to be able to do some comparisons that I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and so, you know, you can uh, tally the number of verse lines, which are called padas. Uh, um, by Sanskritists usually, and then you know you can sort of uh, calculate the corpus size uh, uh, this way by multiplying the number of padas by the number of syllables in the pada to get a sense of how big uh, the corpus is. Okay, so um, the the text we think was maybe composed around 1200 or. Um, Professor Hill suggested 12th century. I don't think it really matters for our purposes. It's, we don't really know uh, exactly. Um, uh, it, it must have been composed over a relatively long period of time because we do see differences in the language of the, the kind of older parts of the text and the younger parts of the text. Um, and then it was transmitted orally for many centuries um, in an incredibly accurate way. Um, and that's, you know, thanks to these feats of memory, uh, and those were, of course, motiv motivated by um, uh, the, uh, the importance sort of given to correct recitation in this particular culture or subculture. Um, uh, but nevertheless, there were some changes made to the text, um, and some of those uh, um, uh, involve the replacement of linguistically older, more archaic forms with, um, uh, with younger uh, ones. Uh, and sometimes the younger ones are the ones that are familiar to us from uh, classical Sanskrit. So you have some basically some old Vedic stuff getting replaced with some younger classical Sanskrit stuff. Um, um, okay, so one of the one of the um, examples that is usually given, because it's almost completely exceptionless here, um, involves a sequence of a consonant uh, in, in the transmitted text, the consonant followed by a glide, either a ya or a wa, which is written with the V, uh, transliterated with the V, followed by a vowel that has like a grave accent mark on it. And that grave, um, is uh, originally representing uh, falling pitch. And this is also essentially the only place where you find a grave accent uh, in the text. Um, so it's a pitch accent language. Um, as a rule, with, with some systematic exceptions, 
uh, lexical words have one uh, syllable that receives a, a high pitch, and the rest of you know the rise to that high and the fall uh, from that high back is um, is sort of phonetic. Right? So this is a little a little exception to that. Um, oh, it's and I should also say the the um, uh, the accent is, is almost, if not purely morphologically, determined the placement of the accent. So, yeah. Okay, so wherever you find this sequence, um, that is to say consonant, glide, and then uh, vowel with falling pitch, um, the, the verse line is one syllable short. Right? So, um, so uh, um, this so this motivate sort of paying attention to the meter um, motivates the uh, reconstruction of an extra syllable. So, just um, as an example, I took the word for sun, which is transmitted as um, swar, and I, I just took some eight-syllable verses with uh, the phrase uh, swar dershi, which means to see the sun, um, and and you can see pratyan vishvam swar dershi is seven syllables, but if you reconstruct suwar dershi, then you get eight syllables. And so this is, you, I think there are like maybe, th there are hundreds if not thousands of examples of this kind of a sequence. It's almost perfectly regular. It's a super clear case of, um, you know, basically paying attention to the meter and then restoring um, a slightly older phonological sequence. And so the change that happened obviously was the gliding of the high vowel and this seems to have introduced um, a new um, accent contrast to the language because the, the pitch fall um, um, was then phonologized apparently as, as, as falling pitch. Um, so suwar, you know, had, that was at a stage where there was just one high pitch accent and syllable and then, and then you say suwar and there's falling pitch still uh, on what's now the only syllable and that gets phonologized uh, as the accent that we write uh, or transliterate with the graph. I hope that was clear. Um, so that was an example where, um, where we, we know and have known for a long time that, that we need to reconstruct an extra syllable. Uh, and now comes uh, an example where um, we need to reconstruct something um, uh, 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 like that in just involves syllable weight, not count. And so um, this is another just, you know, classic textbook example. So um, there's, there's a root, merd, um, which uh, it, uh, means something like be compassionate, take pity. Um, and wherever the root is followed by a vowel, that is to say, the syllable as spelled, the first syllable consists of M and a syllabic R, um, uh, the Rig Veda, the me, you know, paying attention to the me meter of the Rig Veda shows that the first syllable must have been heavy, right? And so normally, mr would be a light syllable that consists of just a, a short vowel, mr counts as a short vowel, um, but it appears to either have been a long vowel or a vowel closed by a consonant. Um, and you can tell this again by looking um, at forms such as uh, the imperative uh, mrdaya, which means uh, take pity. Um, and the poets regularly you know, place this at the end um, of eight syllable verses where we actually expect den da den. So we expect something like mrdaya, right? Or, uh, and, and, but, you know, um, uh, so, um, uh, and so, we, we, in this case, so this is just, you know, sort of, again, like, alerting us to the need for some reconstruction, and then we'll actually use the comparative, well, internal reconstruction and the comparative method, as always, um, to, uh, to, to insert the right form uh, back into the text. And here, the fact that the, that the D slash L um, uh, is retroflex plus um, the Iranian evidence where you find, you know, merged with a consonant between the syllabic R and the D and Avestan is going to motivate us to reconstruct something between merged and merd uh, for, uh, for the Rig Veda, whatever that was. 
certainly it was it still counted as a heavy syllable then. So. Okay, and then so those are pretty exceptionless uh, cases, and then there are cases where you actually have very good evidence for for variation. Um, so. Um, and, 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 the, and this seems to have been sort of up to the poet to use whichever form, you know, he wanted to. Um, uh, and I, I don't think that, that this variation has been very closely studied, so there may be more factors than just uh, metrical factors uh, going on here, but it, it looks pretty, pretty metrically determined to me. Um, and so if, a, a well-known case is the, the date of ablative plural uh, uh, suffix uh, bias, uh, which can be realized either bias or bias, uh, wherever it's at, it, it comes after a heavy syllable, and that's just up to you uh, as the poet. Um, and then uh, there's the older form of the genitive plural ending, um, either a am or a um. It's very hard to tell. Um, um, uh, and the younger form am. So it's only transmitted as am, but we we see. Uh, uh, that essentially the poet uh, got to choose whether he wanted to use monosyllabic am um or disyllabic older uh, am um, um, when, when versifying stuff. And so, for example, if you want to close an eight-syllable verse or a 12-syllable verse, and remember those have a diiambic cadence, they go badum badum, then you will say jana na am um, to mean of the people. Um, and if you are composing an 11-syllable verse, then you're going to say jananam because it gives you the right rhythm. So, and so, um, I guess many Indo-Europeanists would reconstruct this genitive ending as ohom or something like that. Um, and I think pretty much everybody agrees that it sort of survives into um, into both Vedic and Avestan as aam. Um, and then there's the younger form with with the very you know, unsurprising looking contraction. And another reason to assume that it was originally disyllabic is the, the, the accent of the Greek genitive ending own, which is circumflex, and should probably be derived from a two vowel sequence where you have o, om. And so I think that's the standard line on that. Okay, so, so everyone agrees on, on the examples that I've, that I've shown you so far, I think. Um, and uh, they, people have studied this very closely, um, including um, a lot of people in the mid and late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, um, Her uh, Hermann Odenbach and uh, E. Vernon Arnold being uh, two of the most prominent. And many of those were then um, adopted into a metrically restored, uh, that is to say reconstructed uh, text that was published in, in 1994. Um, and so, um, so is, there, is there more to do? And, and I, would, I would say yes, I think we can, we can do more and also should want to do more. Um, because we are now in a position, I think, to be able to say relatively decisive things about forms that are much less frequently attested um, or, and or um, occur in parts of the verse that are not as strictly regulated. So basically we can, um, you know, we, thanks to some advances in, in, in statistics and, and, and stuff like that, we can sort of be a little bit more sure um, about things than, say, um, well, than, than 19th, 20th, early 20th century scholars who just didn't have um, uh, the same sort of tools that we do now. So. Um, uh, here's, here's an example, uh, a verb form e shi ya, um, uh, that's, that means something like I, I could be lord, I could be master, um, and so that uh, has the uh, opt so-called optative suffix e, so that's sort of an irrealis type form, followed by um, the uh, ending for the first person singular uh, in the middle uh, in the middle voice, uh, which is just ah here. And so um, the form is only attested uh, three times uh, in the Rig Veda. Um, and uh, here you see, uh, you know, this is the first eight syllable line, second, third, fourth, and it occurs um, at the end of the 
of an eight syllable line where you expect e shi ya, not e shi ya. Right? So this is a but but if the other if you look at the other uh, two attestations there um, in the first half of an eight syllable verse where the meter is much less strictly regulated and so um, they you know they're not people would not normally feel these to contribute much or any evidence one way or the other. So, um, so, what do we, so what do we do, right? We say, well, it is in the cadence that one time, so I don't know, how often do you expect that sort of thing to happen? It's, not, it's unclear, and so, um, so uh, I think the right thing to do if you aren't in a position to sort of do some careful statistics is just to say, well, I'm not sure. It might just be um, one of the departures from the meter. Um, I don't want to make, make too much of it. And that's sort of what, what Oldenberg did. Um, um, and then others you know, felt freer, um, and they just d did whatever they wanted. <laughs> but, but Oldenberg was very, a very sober worker. So um, OK, so uh, what we're going to do um, now is first note that the, that the, lo the localization of a word um, is partly phonologically determined in just by the nature of uh, metrical composition. And then we're going to compare the way that poets localize a particular word with the way that they localize all of the other words that have the same shape. And when I say shape, I mean phonological properties that matter for the meter. So number of syllables, syllable weight, uh, distribution, and note that we also have to pay attention to um, the onset of the word and the rhyme, uh, or the end of the word, just because of the way resyllabification works across word boundaries in Vedic. So, um, so if you look at this, um, this is the word aham i, right? E shi ya uh, would be lord, but it's it's syllabified ha mi shi ya. Right, so there's, that's an example of, of rightward resyllabification of, of the M. Um, and then uh, here's an example of leftward where mahi plus priya gives you mahip riya, hip then being closed and counting as, as, as a heavy syllable. Right? So w these are the things we have to pay attention to. Syllable count, syllable weight, template, if you will, of the word, and then uh, some things about its edges. Um, and so then uh, here's the, the, the way that I'll be representing this. This gives you the sort of the weight template of the word, so light, heavy, light, and then the final syllable, the, the weight, the, its weight typically depends on what follows, and so that's why it's an X here. And this just says it starts in a single consonant and it ends in a short vowel. Right, so, um, so words, common words, frequent words that belong to that shape class are purushtuta, uh, much praised paravati in the distance, uh, the dhatana y'all put, uh, imperative and that sort of thing. Um, and so, as you would probably have guessed, where the poets like to put this sort of a shape is verse finally in eight syllable verse, um, where it gives a nice di iambic rhythm, purushtuta, uh, paravati, and so forth. And so, what we'll do is we'll just, we'll just, um, you know, look at all of them, and then we will uh, express the pattern, the localization pattern of that class as a, as a vector, right? And so this just means that, you know, there are six that they put at the starting at the, in the first position of an eight syllable verse. So the verse would start with purushtuta. You see that? You get a one in the first position, right? You see that five more times, you get the six. Zero times starting in the second position, one starting in the third zero times starting in the fourth, and then starting in the fifth, which is the latest you can put that in the verse, purush, duta, five, six, seven, eight, right? That's where almost all of them, uh, they put almost all of them when they're composing an eight syllable verse, right? So, um, okay, so um, then in 11 syllable, in this particular shape class, we see that they localize most of them at the beginning of the verse, um, 17 of whatever that is, 26, um, uh, the post-sezeral position is uh, the starting in the fifth position is another spot they'll put them 
And then in 12 syllable, it looks like eight syllable, they just put them line finally because the cadence there is likewise did and did and. So, so, okay, so, and then we just put the three vectors together into one long vector and, and so now we have captured sort of as a mathematical object or whatever, um, uh, sort of what you might think of as like the metrical fingerprint of this shape class. So now we're in a position to compare individual items to the entire class, right? And so that's what, that's what we're going to do. Thank you. So, um, so, and, and I, so I, and I don't want to suggest that, you know, formerly people were doing bad work in this area and now finally I'm doing really good work in this area. That's not true. Um, uh, but, but the, you know, the, there are some, some advantages that I think we can, you know, point, point to. And one is that we're just including a lot more information now. We're not just looking at the cadence of the verse, we're looking at the entire um, evidence. Um, and even though the earlier parts of the verse are not as strictly regulated, they are regulated. And so these are informative uh, things that we're adding to the picture. Um, we're also taking account of the relative frequency of a, of a class in the three verse line types. So, for example, the, the type that we just looked at, the poets like to use that better in eight and 12 syllable verse than they do in 11 syllable verse. You can kind of um, come up with an expected frequency in each verse type just generated by the relative size of those three subcorpora. And you see that they're either avoid, they're avoiding them in 11 and or preferring them in eight and 12. And so that gets sort of captured here as well. Um, and we can work with uh, word shapes that just aren't fit for the cadence, so they only uh, are localized in, in less regulated parts of the verse. And if we do the math correctly, then uh, we're going to be treating the infrequently attested items exactly, you know, ve very exactly. Um, uh, and and uh, we can e even say things about things that are attested three or two or one, one, um, one time. Okay, so um, I think I should, well, I think maybe, okay. Um, so we could say something like, well, what's the probability that the tatana expressed as a vector belongs to the class of, you know, light, heavy, light, X items that are shaped the same way minus the datana? And, um, and so uh, we'll, we'll get a probability value, and those will all be very small. So we'll just take the log of them so that they're easier to work with, and you don't have things like you know, 0 0.0000001345 or something like that. Um, uh, and then, um, yes, and so obviously when you see something like negative 32.5, that doesn't mean anything until you put it relative to the other <coughs> log probability values that you're coming up with. And so just to give you a, a sense of this, the, the, the log probability values for the individual forms of the Rig Veda range from negative 918, that's sort of least probable to belong to its class, to negative 30, which is you know, most probable to belong to its class. And for each class, we can also come up with an average um, uh, so the, the average for this class is negative 31.5, so very similar to the negative 32.5 that we have for the datana. <coughs> now, classes, depending on the shape and, and other, because of differences in shape and so forth, the, their averages are very different from each other. So they range from negative 250, roughly, to negative 30. Um, and that's because what I refer to as sort of tight and loose classes. So the one that we just looked at is tight in the sense that there are only a few places where the poets can sort of fit them into the, or do fit them into the verse. And, um, and something like CVC-shaped monosyllables, um, that's with a short vowel, they, they put those in almost any position in the verse. And so it's in these sort of loose classes that you really get to see um, the other things that are sort of determining word order in the Rig Veda, like like syntax. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, okay, so, um, all right, so, 
so th here I'm just reminding you of, of Ishiya, and notice also Rasiya is another optative like this, um, where you would expect Rasiya, um, I would give over. Um, and so this will be our very brief case study. So we'll just look at all of the um, optative forms of the first person, optative forms that end in E, yeah, these first person singular uh, medial forms. And you can see there are just uh, 15 of them. Um, and one, uh, so 15 tokens and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven types. Um, so it's very, this is a not, not a well-attested <laughs> Uh, uh, class. Um, and so for each form we're going to make two comparisons. We're going to compare the form with its shape mates and then we're going to compare the form with its putative shape mates. That is to say, or for example, we're going to compare ishiya with other things that are shaped like ishiya is spelled and then we're going to compare ishiya with uh, everything that's shaped like ishiya, the form that we're considering reconstructing or restoring. Um, and then we're going to say, well, is it more probable that Ishiya belongs to its apparent class, or is it more probable that Ishiya actually belongs to the class of things that are shaped Ishiya? And so, um, so here's, so we, um, leaving uh, Bakshiya aside for a second, um, we've, we do find a kind of a distribution, something that looks like it might be a distribution here. Um, so for Ishiya and Rasiya, those two seem, you know, seem to have Iya with a short I, that is to say something to, to reconstruct. With the other ones, you seem to have um, uh, a, a long I, which is the classical Sanskrit form as well, and the one that's transmitted in the text. Um, and uh, it also, seems to be the case that you get ia, the, the sort of reconstructed form after a heavy syllable, and ia uh, after a light one. That doesn't look crazy in a language that has a fair amount of morphophonology that promotes syllable weight alternation um, uh, and uh, is also in an environment like iambic verse that promotes syllable weight uh, alternation. So, um, and, and Baksh, uh, uh, so but by this distribution we would expect, um, you know, Bakshiya with a short I because Bak is a heavy syllable, uh, but uh, we, we find better evidence for Bakshiya with the, with the sort of, um, uh, yeah, with the form that we expect. And so, um, so this is as far as this takes us. It sort of uh, suggests, I, I would say, the method suggests that we take the, the reconstruction of a, of, of with a short I as a, at least a variant um, pretty seriously. And then now we just go back to doing what we always do, uh, which is internal reconstruction and, and external reconstruction. And what I, what I suppose, um, here's a scenario that seems plausible to me. I think um, we know what the etymology of the sequence is. It's ich uh, And so um, I, I guess that may have just the ia with a short i may have been the, the, rel the, the regular um, uh, outcome of that. Uh, that's also what Brugman uh, thought, um, but he didn't know about the two laryngeals. So, uh, um, and, uh, and then you get uh, ia changed to ia by, by analogy, and there are various ways to do this, but um, if you wanted to do it as you know, four-part analogy, I guess you would say something like, Third person is the eta, which is, by the way, this e is a long vowel, um, always. Eta is to eia, as eta is to x, and x you would solve for eia, but you could also do it differently if you like. Um, and uh, so that seems like a, um, a plausible source of the, the younger form. And then what we would have is another sort of a poet's choice situation where you have an older that's still around uh, that the poets opt to use, especially uh, after uh, heavy syllables because they're composing in weight alternating meter. Um, and, then you, um, uh, and, then, and then you also have the younger form that we know from classical Sanskrit as, as iya. 
So thank you for your attention. That's, that's it in short. And I'd like, just to remind you, I am extremely interested if you can think of uh, other places where we could sort of try this out. Uh, and mainly we, I think, just need some sort of text which is in a, like, the organization of which is fairly phonological, <laughs> um, obviously not completely phonological, um, and uh, where we need to figure things out about the chronology. Thank you.